welcome to this Mortar Bus Archive video. This is the first in a series of videos we will be producing, each covering a particular topic or theme. As well as discussing the topic, we will also show you how different sources of documents and information have been used and how you too can carry out your own research. This video is entitled Jigsaw Theory and we will look at how small pieces of information from a variety of sources can be put together to build a bigger picture. Bringing together all the elements of Mortar's bus history is like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle where the pieces from three different puzzles have been mixed together and you don't know what the picture is for any of them. All you can do is slowly try and piece things together. Each piece of information on its own may appear to be insignificant, but start piecing the individual facts together and a much clearer overall picture will start to appear just like doing a jigsaw. So let's start with this photograph of an early Maltese bus, which was sent to me a couple of years ago by Stuart Abella. It had first appeared in the newsletter of the Old Motors Club at least 10 years before, but no one knew anything about the image. There are four key questions that need answering. What make is the bus? What number is it? Who are the people in the photograph? And what year was the photo taken? Let's start with what information can be found in the image itself. There is a fleet name of the Modern Motor Company. Moster is mentioned, although it's spelt the old way as Muster. And there is a distinctive design to the front axle spokes and the radiator. Do we have any mention of the Modern Motor Company in known records? Put simply, no. Well, not so far anyway. But there was a modern garage in Slema but it's not believed there was any connection between the Slema and Moster operations. The thick spokes suggest a former lorry chassis, as extended car chassis, the other common source for early Maltese buses, tended to have a larger number of much thinner spokes, a bit like on a modern bicycle. The square radiator, with a rounded chrome top and a rectangle in the middle, possibly a badge of some sort, are of a distinctive design and would help identify who built the chassis. I sent the image to Terry Partridge back in the UK, who has helped a lot with matching up front axles and radiator designs with the make of the chassis. It took him a couple of hours, but then he came back to me with an answer. The chassis was a Napier and would have been a World War I military lorry, similar to the one in this period photograph. The axle spoke design matches and the radiator is the same too, although the top has been painted over so the chrome top and badge cannot be seen. Now the name Napier rang a bell. I had recently been going through a number of old files for buses that had been replaced in the 1920s and 30s that were then stored for possible reuse but had never been used. By 1941 there was a huge demand for additional lorries and vans, especially for use by the military authorities and a good number of those long stored former buses were resurrected, given simple conversions and put into use with a new registration number. Often also a replacement second hand engine was fitted. Looking through my notes, I found mentions of two Napiers, one formerly registered 145 and the other 207. Since then, I have found several other Napiers, including some in the backgrounds of old photographs. The number 145 rang a bell too, and looking through my records, I found mention of a Chevrolet numbered 145 that had been new in 1929 and was listed as having run on the Moster to Valletta route. Click. A couple of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fell into place. The bus in the photograph mentioned Moster. 145 had been a Napier and the replacement 145 is known to have run between Moster and Valletta. And if you look really closely at where the registration plate should be and half close one eye, I think you can just about make out a five. So it appears that the photograph is almost certainly of Napier bus 145. At the headquarters of the National Archives of Malta, located in Hospital Street, Rabat, they hold a vast collection of volumes of the Commissioner's occurrence books from Malta Police. These were compiled on a day-to-day -day basis by each police division, normally then broken down into each police station in that division. 
There were nine divisions on Malta, plus tenth covering Gozo. The National Archives of Malta, at Rabat, has volumes from six of the nine Malta divisions. Two others are still held by the police for now, and the volumes from the ninth, Caspicua, were destroyed in an arson attack on the police station back in the 1970s. So far, I have mostly covered the periods 1905 to 1906 and 1920 to 1931. These books contain a vast amount of information about incidents that occurred, mostly quite minor by today's standards, but amongst the entries are many involving buses, their drivers and conductors. Examples of entries for buses include failure to wear their badge correctly, regulations required it to be displayed prominently on their breast, picking up or dropping off passengers at unauthorised places, there were far fewer bus stages and stops in the early days, so buses often used to try and get away with stopping at other locations to help their passengers. It was also an offence to pick up or alight passengers whilst the vehicle was still in motion. Carrying too many passengers. Each bus carried a certificate to state how many passengers it was allowed to carry, often splitting the capacity into inside, the main seating area, and outside, either beside the driver at the front or maybe a seat or two on the open balcony at the rear or the gallery as it was often known to many Maltese at the time. If a bus carried too many passengers there was a potential danger of axles giving way or the stability of the vehicle being compromised especially if too many were in the rear of the bus. No lights at night. Often it would be the rear light or lantern that was not lit. Accidents involving other vehicles, people or animals. These would often be relatively minor, though those involving animals could often be fatal for them. Not being a licensed driver or conductor. To act as EV you needed an official license from the Commissioner of Police. In the case of drivers you also needed a special license as well as your normal driving license. The conductor sitting on the step. It was illegal for conductors or anyone else for that matter, to sit or stand on the step of the bus whilst it was moving. Despite how often conductors were fined for doing this, they still seemed to keep doing it. Working a route they were not licensed to run on. Although fixed routes to many villages did not come into force until 1931, it was still a requirement for the owner or driver to have a license for the route they intended to operate their bus on. An exception was if the bus had been hired by an individual to carry people from one place to another as there were not separate private hire buses prior to 1931. I looked through my entries and found one from 1924 that mentioned bus 145. The driver, Angelo Shikluna, lived in Mostar, so this reinforced my belief that the bus in the photograph was 145. In this particular case he was fined two shillings and sixpence for failing to display in a frame affixed to the bus the vehicle's licence to operate. Further entries for bus 145 were found. The earliest shows that the bus was in use by the summer of 1922 and the last mention found so far is for the summer of 1927. This gives a window in which the photograph was taken and my guess is that it was probably earlier rather than later, maybe even when the bus was first purchased. Angelo Shikluna was the person most often listed as the driver, suggesting it was probably him stood by the cab of the bus, maybe with his father Matteo towards the rear with an unknown small boy. There was also an entry for an Andrea Shikluna driving the bus in 1926. His age was younger than Angelo, but the entry confirms his father was also Matteo, making Andrea a younger brother of Angelo. Note that Andrea's badge number and special license number are also listed in the entry. Yet more analysis of the police occurrence book entries provides more details about the other buses the Shikluna brothers drove. Angelo is listed as driving bus 125 in 1924 and 25, bus 145 as already mentioned between 1922 and 1926, 1117 between 1925 and 1927 and 1990 between 1928 and 1930. In the case of the last one the entries suggest that he had moved by that stage to the village of Lear.
Andrea is listed as driving bus 145 in 1926, 1117 in 1926 and 27, and bus 554 between 1928 and 1930. From the vehicle records, it is believed that bus 125 was a Ford, quite possibly a Model T. 145 was the Napier in the photograph. 554 was possibly a Rugby. 1117 was apparently a Daimler, probably built on a former World War I ambulance chassis. And 1990 was a Chevrolet. Another useful set of documents held by the National Archives of Malta at Rabat are old passport applications. From around 1915, these include copies of the photographs submitted with the application, allowing faces to be put to names. The documents also provide or confirm other details. For applications up to 1938, the search page at the Archives Portal Europe webpage can be used. Type in the name of a person in Malta and it will list any matches it finds. Two applications for Angelo Chacluna were found, 1917 and 1937, but nothing for Andrea. Angelo's two photographs are shown here, and they nicely fit either side of the early to mid-1920s photograph of him with the bus. Let us take a more detailed look at Angelo's 1937 application. Firstly, we can see that his father is listed as Matthew, or Matteo, helping us confirm that we probably have the right man. It mentions he was living in Leer. Again, this ties in nicely with the Police of Corinth's book entries from 1928 that also mention him there. It says that he was born in 1899 in Mostar. And again, this matches up with what we know from the Police of Corinth's book entries. It states that his profession was motor driver again tying in with what we know. There appear to have been a semi-fixed list of professions, with motor driver applying to someone who drove any type of motor vehicle as their job. Virtually no mentions have been found for bus driver. Finally, the planned destination is listed, normally including why they were travelling. In this case, it says Angelo was off to Sicily for a medical procedure. The name Shikluna, the village of Mostar, and the bus industry have another connection that I have found numerous mentions of in the old vehicle files. Joseph Shikluna was known for much of his life as Tareo, as for much of the 1930s he was the importing agent of Rio chassis used for both buses and trucks. Over 100 chassis are known to have been imported by him that decade. The business he set up, Shikluna Enterprises, was frequented by many bus owners as he also stocked spare parts, bearings, lubricants and other supplies. His company can still be found in Mostar and is shown in this Google Street View image. But the question was, was he related to Angelo and Andrea? A further search of the Passport Applications database found applications from Joseph dated 1920 and 1937. If we look at his 1937 application, it confirms his father was also Matthew. It also states that he was born in Mostar in 1897, making him the oldest brother of the three. He is listed as being a merchant or agent, which fits in with what we know about his business interests, confirming this is definitely the right man. Here we see both his 1920 and 1937 passport photographs. He does not appear to have changed much over the 17 years between them. Finally, it cannot be stressed how important it is to get out and talk to people, either directly to those who used to work in the bus industry, such as owners, 
drivers, conductors, dispatchers, mechanics, bus builders, traffic police, and various others, or if the individual is no longer with us, a member of their family, or indeed anyone that used to know them well. This photograph came from Marika Camilleri, a colleague at the National Archives in Rabat. Her mother's aunt was married to the cousin of the Shikluna brothers, Francesco Shikluna. He was also a merchant and appears to have worked with Joseph for a time importing the Rio chassis. The photograph shows on the left a Rio chassis fitted with what appears to be a temporary platform on which the majority of the people are standing. Sadly, we don't know who the majority of these people are. Note also the Rio speed wagon lettering down the side of the platform. On the right is a Rio bus, 1754 from the Bercacara route. This was new in the latter half of 1933 to Antonio as a party of Ormi. So this may not only help us date the photograph, if it was taken around the time 1754 was built, but may help identify one of the people stood with that bus. The location of the photograph is believed to be near the centre of Mostar, not far from the famous church. And here we see Francesco Chicluna's passport photograph from 1930. I am told that he apparently used to import seagull engines, a type of outboard motor for small boats, Vulcan and Lessonol paints, and Tim Ken bearings. I am also told that Marika's mother remembers as a child, after World War II, finding a crate out the back of the shop that had an unused Rio engine in it. And could this be Joseph Shikluna Tareo? If we look at his 1937 passport photograph, it certainly looks as though it could be him. Another person I have talked to about Angelo Shikluna is the well-known bus expert Joe Kataya, who as a resident of Leah knows virtually everything to do with the buses and the bus people in that village. He recalls many years ago seeing Angelo when he was a much older man. By then he had stopped driving buses. Joe says that bus 1990, a Chevrolet named Diamond Star, belonged to Angelo's father-in-law, Carmelo Sherry, who also lived in Leah. Angelo's move from Mostar to Leah probably coincided with him getting married. By the end of 1931, the bus had been sold on, and so far no later mentions have been found of Angelo working with buses, other than the 1937 passport application listing him as a motor driver. Hopefully once the 1930s police occurrence book volumes have been examined, it will become clearer as to how long he continued to drive buses. So let us wrap things up with a summary of the sources of information used and the jigsaw pieces or facts uncovered. We've looked at old photographs, seen information from the old vehicle files dating back to the early 1930s, police occurrence books, passport applications, and the recollections and knowledge of various individuals. When it comes to answering the four key questions about the photograph, it appears that we have a Napier bus, registered 145, that in the image we see Angelo Shikluna, his father Matteo, and an unknown small boy, and that the photograph was probably taken in the first half of the 1920s. Another useful source of information, though not used in this case, are old newspapers. The English language Times of Malta has a subscription-based archive of old editions of the paper dating back to 1930. The National Library, located in the heart of Valletta, has various English and Maltese language newspapers on microfiche available for viewing, though I would need a translator to access the Maltese ones. Before we finish this video, a brief word on how you can help the work of the Malta Bus Archive. There is enough work to occupy an individual for decades, so a team of volunteers is being put together. Can you spare a couple of hours a week? This may be evenings or weekends. This would also involve mostly working from home. We urgently need individuals to translate written and transcribe spoken Maltese into English, especially where interviews have been recorded. Whilst this can be time-consuming work, when broken down into, say, 20 to 30 minute chunks, done a few days or evenings a week, the work soon gets done. If you are someone who worked in the industry, or are descended from someone who did, would you be willing for a member of the team to come and talk to you? Have you got any old photographs in family albums, or old documentation or other items that we could copy or examine? Do you know people who used to work in the industry? Maybe a neighbour, 
or someone you often see in your village or at a club. Talk to them. See if they would be willing to talk to us. Or we can provide some initial questions that you can ask them to help build a profile for them. And importantly, Gozo must not be forgotten. We would especially love to hear from you if you or your family have any connections with Gozo's bus industry, past or present. If you want to contact the Mortar Bus Archive, you can either email us at mortarbusarchive, all as one word, at gmail.com, or you can search for the Mortar Bus Archive on Facebook and apply to join our group there. This brings to a close this video on jigsaw theory, the Shakluna family of Mostar, and the sources of information that can be used to piece together a bigger picture. Further videos on other topics are planned, so watch out for announcements as they are uploaded. By all means get in touch if you want to talk about any of the sources of information mentioned and how they may be used for your own research, such as family history or tracking the history of your village.